evening. Mr. President, Madame Eredama, <laughs> Ambassador Hill, Mr. Consul General, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you this evening. My name is Claude Destray, and I am a member of the faculty at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies and the director of the Center on Rights Development. Before introducing our Dean, Ambassador uh, Christopher Hill, who will introduce our keynote speaker, uh, President Alejandro Toledo, I have some short remarks. Tonight is the closing keynote for the 16th Annual Center on Rights Development Spring Symposium. The Center on Rights Development, CORD, is the oldest center at the Corbell School. Each year, CORD focuses on a theme taken from the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or the ICESCR. The ICESCR is probably the least known of the three major international instruments that make up what is known as the International Bill of Rights. In past years, CORD has focused on such themes as the right to water, the right to education, and the right to health in emergency situations. Next year, CORD will focus on gender and human rights. What makes CORD unique is that other than me, the center is run entirely by Corbell students. This year's symposium, Sovereign and Sacred, Indigenous Rights and Environmental Justice, was put together by an amazing team of students who have also become my friends and my colleagues. I'd like to introduce you to them and ask, you them, to ask them to either stand or just raise your hand so that you can be acknowledged. First, Laurel Hayden, CORD's Associate Director, whose personal interest in family history added passion and strength to this year's theme. And Kendra, or Kristen Garendo, excuse me, the Symposium and Events Coordinator, who organized was organizational skills and attention to detail made the symposium both robust and seamless. Corey Greer, Symposium Events uh, Assistant, uh, Jordan Reer, uh, and Catherine Bryant, Research and Education Co-Coordinators, Eli Bankhart, Eli Bankhart, excuse me, Research and Education Assistant, Marisa Lotharina and Tara Dillon, Communications and Media Co-Coordinators, Jessica Rush, Community Outreach and Strategic Development Coordinator, and Daniel Myers, our Stallworth Communications and Media Intern. So a thanks to all of you for the work that you do. I would also like to thank all of our speakers, our panelists, and moderators who wove together their academic expertise and personal histories to make, take us on an intellectual and emotional journey. A symposium like this allows us to not only explore the legal, historical, and human rights issues, but also explore our personal relationship with a people or an idea. My late wife, Elizabeth, was working on her MA and eventual doctorate in education at Harvard, focusing on the history and present practice of Native American education when she died. Her work introduced me to the long, drawn-out process of repatriation of artifacts and remains from major museums like the Smithsonian and the Peabody to the tribes and nations where they belonged. When I remarried, Tamara and I moved to Tucson, Arizona to teach at the University of Arizona. Tamara, who is now the Henry R. Luce Professor of Conflict Resolution here at the Corbell School, is an expert on intractable inter-ethnic conflict and was probably the first Anglo-academic woman to be trusted by both the Hopi and the Navajo. And she and they introduced me to the complex issues of land and water use in the Arizona Sonoran Desert and in Indian country. I remember the day I went before the tribal council of the Tohono O'odham Nation to ask permission to create a healing maze and the Itoi, the man in the maze, that had been part of the tribe's tradition from time immemorial. They were pleased that I had come to ask, and I was shocked to hear that I was the first person to actually ask permission before appropriating this very sacred and iconic symbol. After we moved here, I was hired as a consultant and mediator between the tribes and nations on one part, the US government on the another part, and the energy companies on a third part. The issue, energy right of way, may sound obscure to you, but it was seen by the tribes and nations as a bright line regarding their sovereignty. The past caught up with the future. Broken promises and broken treaties of 100 years ago were present memory and read, ran headlong into the need for modern complex energy grid across the US <coughs> deemed essential to our national security. National security 
seen by many at those meetings as another word for theft and oppression. My present work on forced labor and human trafficking and my study of torture always seems to be intertwined with the rights of indigenous people. My future work on climate justice points to an overwhelming negative effect whose brunt will be mostly felt by the poor and indigenous peoples. I've had these encounters over the years. And yes, I too have the Native American jewelry and the indigenous artwork. But I realize that these have been almost chance encounters and a sideways glance into the lives and cultures of another people. My own internal culture as a privileged Anglo male from a very old aristocratic European heritage makes it nearly impossible to truly connect. And that saddens me. We share the same planet, the same sky, sun, and moon. We try and share the same land though begrudgingly, that we seem to remain worlds apart. I wonder why. I would now like to introduce you to our Dean, Ambassador Christopher Hill. Before joining the Corbell School as our Dean in 2010, he was a former career diplomat, a four-time ambassador nominated by three presidents. His last posting before coming to Corbell was as the US Ambassador to Iraq, a posting that was meant to prepare him for the rough and tumble world of academics. Now, I still don't know which he thinks is more, was a more difficult assignment, the Iraqi government officials and insurgents or Corbell faculty. We'll soon find out, perhaps, in the years to come. But prior to joining the Foreign Service, Ambassador Hill served in the Peace Corps, where he supervised credit unions in rural Cameroon, Africa. Ambassador Hill graduated from Bode College in Brunswick, Maine with a BA in Economics. He received his master's degree from the Naval War College in 1994. He speaks Polish, Serbo-Croatian, and Macedonian. Now, I have always really liked that last part and often wanted to reply, well, doesn't everyone speak Serbo-Croatian and Macedonian? So ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you our Dean, Ambassador Christopher Hill. Thank you very much, Claude, and uh, thank you so much for all you do uh, at our school, and especially for what you do for our human rights program, and in particular for the Center on, uh, on uh, Human Rights, on, on Rights. So um, it is, uh, I'm not going to speak very long because I don't think people came here to listen to me. Uh, I think people came here to listen to a truly ex uh, extraordinary individual. You know, when your students, Claude, got together and decided they wanted to have uh, discuss uh, the issues of indigenous peoples, I can imagine they thought to themselves, well, who could we invite? And maybe someone said, well, why not invite the first president, the first indigenous president in 500 years in the Western, uh, Western Hemisphere? And I think with that in mind, our students very wisely reached out to uh, Alejandro, uh, Toledo, who um, comes to us as a, uh, he was a president of Peru from 2001 to 2006. He led Peru through many issues, including uh, investments in health care, education. He was able to get Peru on a, uh, on a positive growth track. Peru is a country that uh, certainly does not lack for challenges, and, uh, and he was able to rise up and meet those challenges. Today, uh, after his, his time there, Peru was able to begin a uh, substantial economic growth rate, over 6%, and it became one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America. He came to uh, his, his position, really, as, a, as an economist, having worked in the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, also the UN. He um, led, uh, he was also a political activist, leading um, Peru, uh, leading uh, an opposition against a, uh, an autocratic regime of uh, Alberto Fujimori, probably made in Japan, didn't quite work for uh, Peru at the time. Uh, and, um, and, uh, but once he ran for president, he was democratically elected, I think a very important detail. Um, uh, President Toledo was born in a uh, small village, actually in the Peruvian Andes, 
and uh, that village was 12,000 feet in, um, up in, uh, in uh, altitude, so he's not particularly impressed by our 5,280 feet in Denver. Uh, he grew up in a family with a family of 16 siblings. And I think uh, Governor uh, Hakenlooper, who was having dinner with him last night, asked, what number were you? And he said, I was number eight. And Governor Hickenlooper said, oh, a middle child, indeed. <laughs> so um, he's done many jobs before becoming uh, president. Starting at the age of six, he was a street uh, shoe shiner. He sold newspapers, lottery tickets. He helped his family supplement the family income. And uh, he had an encounter with Peace Corps volunteers who he met uh, in his village and actually invited them to uh, stay at his home. I mean, just a remarkable story. He received a BA in Economics and Business Administration from the University of San Francisco, uh, California, MA in Economics, MA and PhD in Economics, Human Resources from the, from the School of Education at Stanford University. He returned to uh, Stanford after his term as president where he was a distinguished, uh, he's been a distinguished fellow in residence at the University Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science, also a Payne uh, Distinguished Visiting Lecturer at the Freeman Spogli Institute, Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. He's founded and continues to serve as the president of the Global Center for Development and Democracy. I would say he has had many accomplishments. Of course, he's uh, uh, authored a recent book, The Shared Society, but perhaps his greatest accomplishment is in marrying Eliane Carp Toledo, his wife, who, who is here today. Those of you who had the opportunity to come to the, uh, to the conference heard uh, uh, Eliane uh, talk about uh, indigenous rights herself. She also has a distinguished career, having worked in the World Bank, specializing in measurements of social impact and development programs. I mean, just a truly remarkable, as we would say in the U.S., power couple. So, uh, Mr. President, it is such an honor for the University of Denver, an honor for the Corbell School to, to host you here. We hope this will not be the last time that you come here. We, you are most welcome any time. We realize you've been at Stanford. That's a very good school, but you should also come to the University of Denver, and there's much to like here at the University of Denver. So we are extremely appreciative that you've come here and spent some of your very valuable time with us. So thank you very much, and let me invite you up to say a few words. So we'll begin with a short video, and, and uh, President Toledo will follow that. This is always fun. This is pretty classic, yes? You can talk, ch chat with your neighbor so you don't make us feel so us, <laughs> self conscious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Shall we try this one just to see?
Associate researcher at Stanford University's prestigious Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. From a multidiscipline perspective, he shared his knowledge on urgent current affairs issues such as the future of democracy, the fight against poverty, quality education, water problems, global warming and the environment, food security social programs and social inclusion, citizen insecurity, and the construction of an efficacious state. This contact enabled him to closely follow the changes occurring in the economy, politics, science, and technology, and compare them with progress being made in Peru. As a result of this period of reflection and analysis, Dr. Toledo wrote two books. The first was an analysis of his government from 2001 to 2006, titled Crecer para Incluir, or Growing for Inclusion, which described how at the start of his mandate, he found a country mired in recession, which he would lead to vigorous growth by the time he left office five years later. His second book, The Shared Society, reveals a perspective, optimistic vision of Latin America over the next 50 years where he provides recommendations for what the region needs to do to share economic growth. Dr. Alejandro Toledo has returned to academic research, but he has not forgotten his political involvement and his constant work to promote Peru abroad. He has also met with business groups interested in learning more about Peru's economic growth and the possibility of exploring new investment opportunities in Peru. In each of the countries where he has made a presentation, the former president has stated that in order to achieve development, countries must execute state policies that are sustainable over time. In all these places, Dr. Toledo has been recognized as a statesman who put the economy in order, halted inflation, laid the foundations for growth, organized successful social programs such as Juntos and SIS, expanded the country's road network, increased exports, and opened up new global markets. But he is also recognized as a president who respected democracy, human rights, and citizens' freedoms, the rights of indigenous communities and youth, in addition to forging a more democratic and inclusive government. Dr. Toledo has been decorated with the Presidential Medal for Defense of Democracy, awarded for the first time to a former head of state, jointly by three institutions, the Council of the Americas, the Democracy Defense Fund, and the United States Council on Foreign Relations. At the United Nations, he inaugurated the global debate on achieving the objectives of the millennium. Between academic conferences, business meetings and awards, Dr. Toledo has always been in contact with the country, 
focusing on the present and future of Peru. With that goal in mind, he created the Global Center for Development and Democracy, an institution that gathers together former Latin American presidents and presented the social agenda for democracy at the Iberian American Summit in Portugal. The center, known as CGDD, has also made important progress in the territorial development program in the Lurin watershed via the integral management of water in the upper Andean reaches, the construction of reservoirs, technical irrigation, and commercial associations, which have had a direct impact on improving living standards in these communities. Recently, with the backing of the World Bank and its president, Jim Yong Kim, Dr. Toledo presented in Lima the Latin American Institute of Leadership and Public Management, aimed at training young people with a new vision of politics and public management. Dr. Toledo has decided to use his wealth of experience in the academic field and state administration for the benefit of the country. Together with his lifetime partner, Elian Karp, he shares a vision of a new Peru with growth and development. A country with equal opportunities, more tolerant, inclusive, and democratic. Alejandro Toledo has returned and is with us today to build a Peru with justice for all. Ambassador Christopher Hill, Director of the, the Joseph Colbert School of International Studies, My friends of the Center on Rights Development. My friends of the new Center for Latin American Studies. My friend Claude the Tree. Arona Schneider. My friend Oliver Kaplan. My friend General Counsel of Peru in Colorado. My friends, after I read the program that you have uh, constructed for this symposium, sovereign and sacred indigenous rights and environmental justice. Subject matters that you have chosen particularly build around the efforts of the students are really impressive. It is a great privilege for a woman of my life, Ilian, and for me, to come to the University of Denver and specifically to the Colbert School of International Studies. Issues such as indigenous rights and environmental justice, Native American nations' survival and the future of the United States. Are you guys machine? 
conflict and climate change environmental refugees. Who owes the earth resources and the land rights? Exploitation of Native American sacred sites. Indigenous people and social inclusion. Competing jurisdiction, the struggle of indigenous self-determination. Issues that are so close to my intellectual work, but more importantly, deep into my heart. I'm impressed by a university and by school that touches issues that are in the front run, particularly looking at the future. We're leaving tomorrow, and I wrote show presented the book, our recent book on the shared society. Have you a vision for the global future of Latin America? A very uh, impertinent academic work that looks at the future of the world and the role that Latin America will play in a changing global world by 2050. Tomorrow we'll go back to Stanford to present this book that was published by Stanford University Press. And the book, uh, I'm anxious to see it in Spanish for reasons that you probably well would understand. I need Peruvians to read it. And it will be translated in several languages. And I'm uh, I'm pleased that I can begin this show here at this school. Thank you for all you have done from the bottom of my heart to make us feel comfortable these two years, two days. Because of what you, I have read, I have changed my mind. So I sent a PowerPoint presentation with the numbers. My training was in econometrics. And I wrote my thesis on the impact of investment in human capital and its impact on employment and income distribution. Because uh, many years later, I have read it, the book that was based on my thesis, and it was published by Saxon House in England. I don't understand it. <laughs> So uh, I'm not going to bother you with a PowerPoint. You have it. If you want to take a look at the numbers, please welcome. I want to share with you my thoughts, my vision, my irreverence, and have some time for exchanging views, frankly. And we know, don't be afraid. But before that, I have a petition to ask you. I told uh, Governor Hickenlooper, who is a friend of mine, I have a petition. Please help the General Counsel of Peru, who is doing an extraordinary job, to take care of all my Peruvians, friends who are in Colorado, and Washington, Seattle, and California, working as shepherds. 
please help me to defend the rights of not being mistreated and exploited. I know they need to survive. I know they came over here, but with all due respect to the investors, and I stimulate investment for growth, but don't mistreat them of underpay or violate their rights. That's a petition. The shared society. I said that it's a deliberately provocative book that perhaps breaks the boundaries of a rigorous, strictly econometric academic piece of work. For good or for bad, I combine academics with politics. I hope it's not a politics of the short term. The premises of the book is that Latin America is the promising continent in the world for the next 35 years when we reach the year 2050. And the world will be 9 billion people. Latin American is a promising continent and the changing world by the year 2050. This optimism, however, is not free of enormous challenges and a demand for inspired intelligence and leadership from the region. Leadership that requires not making a decision thinking in the next election, but that rather thinking in the life profile of the next generations by the year 2050. And that means that we need to begin make decisions today thinking in the year 2050. Today. State policies by definitions on medium and long term mature. And it takes the courage to make them knowing that you will not benefit from their results. So maybe the region and the world needs today more leadership and less politics. The reason of, of, for my cautious optimism is number one, the region has a great advantages and a tremendous challenges. What's the advantage? Well, the region is about 600 million people. Thanks to technology, the wars in the world will no longer be about oil, petroleum, or gas. Silicon Valley has just produced a car whose energy is fits with a solar panel. I drove the car. So those countries who have been adopting a very authoritarian populist regimes because they are inundated with oil will no longer submit their populations to the insult of the dignity of the poor by giving them fish away instead of providing them the right to learn how to fish. The price of oil is dropping, and 
if we have another sources of energy, and we already have it, it's not yet on the market, but it is already have it. The countries in Latin America and in the Arab countries who have a lot of oil, they will have to drink the oil because we will not, there will not be a demand for it. By the year 2050, the world, however, will confront other type of challenges that requires the, the decision, determination, the courage, and the inspired leadership to make this decision now. We will confront, if we don't make the decision now, scarcity of clean drinking water. We will confront the challenge of food, food security. If we are not have the courage and the leadership to confront today's climate changes in the world, and we have failed so far, despite the meeting of the Kyoto Protocol or the Copenhagen protocol, or the meeting we just had it in Lima, worldwide, and hopefully something will happen in Paris this year, then the kids, our children, and the children of our children will suffer the consequence of the climate changes by the year 2050, when maybe I will not, no longer will be here. But I'm, it's the responsibility to make the decisions now. So some of the challenges. Why is Latin America the promising continent of the world in the next 35 years, providing we meet the challenges today. Latin America has 37% of the world water in the region. 37% of the world water. It's an advantage. Provided we don't contaminate it. Secondly, biodiversity. We can produce all the food that we can, agro-industry, all the year round, while all the parts of the world for climate reasons cannot do the same. I can do ceviche and pisco sour in Stanford with a Peruvian lemon and have Peruvian asparagus. Free trade agreement, yes that we can produce all year round, and sometimes twice a year, asparagus. We're the world's largest producer of what's green asparagus in the world. Green, why the asparagus is trying? We have a, not only biodiversity, we have such a culture rich diversity, which is our strength. I'm proud of my roots. A nation that does not understand its origins and its roots, or where it, it comes from, is a nation with our soul. And it would be very difficult to find a path to the future. Yes, I'm the result of a statistical error. 
come and from come from from an Andean region twelve thousand feet above sea level one of seventeen brothers and sisters seven of them died and I'm the number eight I just barely made it I was lucky I'm the result of a statistical error. And that's what I made it in the world. But people of different origins, background, or gender have the right to be not the result of a statistical error, have the right to have access to a clean, portable water, sanitation, health care. I want to kill early malnutrition in order to habilitate children to do good at school with, together with quality of health care and education. An enormous challenge, long-term maturity. To survive and make a growing economy based on extractive industry only is very risky and very vulnerable. I welcome investment of all types. Peru and Latin America have been blessed or have been cursed by having too many natural resources. And governments had too easy the responsibility to govern based on the structuring of natural resources and sell it to the international market. The vulnerability is that we don't control the prices of the, our commodities in the international market. And we're very dependent so the first challenge is to diversify the composition of economic growth. Welcome the extractive industry. But we need a small and a strong state that demands that the extractive industry complies with the social and environmental responsibilities. It is today the technology to comply with those responsibilities. We just have seen it in Australia, in Canada, and it's cheap. Perhaps your gains will drop a little bit, but in the medium and long term, you have a, the community being part of your entrepreneurship. A contaminated the drinking water or the water for doing agricultural subsistence is not allowed now. We need to diversify the composition of growth. We need to be strong and demanding to comply with the corporate social responsibility. We need to invest in the minds of our people. The rate of return to investment and reducing or eliminating earlier malnutrition, providing health care and educational quality is very profitable for a nation with a vision of medium and long term. The opportunity is there. We need to have the leadership to implement decisions that does not provide popularity returns 
in the short term. And that's why I insist on the need of more leadership and less politics. My friends, another challenge that the region confronts looking at the future is the need to build strong democratic institutions. that will lead us to social stability, politi political stability, economic stability, legal stability, because we need to attract capital investment for growth. We cannot fall into the irresponsible position of trying to redistribute poverty. We need to have growth. For that, we need to have investment. For that, we need to have the stability. But as an economist and a social scientist, who no longer is very cautious about academia, with all due respect to academia, and I have 40 years in the academic world, but I had the responsibility of conducting the destiny of my country and lead a foundation worldwide, particularly in Latin America. Now, we need to think about academic work that leads to, to policy implications. I made my jump from academia to politics. I guess I lost my mind when I was at Harvard and became a Michiganan and got into politics. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> because I was, I did not feel comfortable teaching or writing books about poverty without affecting the poor because it was too close to my heart. I came from there. So only a crazy guy would get into politics, being at Harvard, without knowing how deep the, the swimming pool was and how big the crocodiles were in politics. I never been in parks before. Now, When I concluded my presidency, a lot of people were clapping because I did well in bringing back the economy. I left it growing at 7.5%. I received it in minus 3%. Inflation was over 10%. Fiscal deficit was growing up enormously. People were, did not want to invest in Peru because they suspected where the Fujimori government was going. So you would, if you look at my web page, you would see Toledo did a great in the economics. But that's not my pride. Economics is a mean. Economic growth is an indispensable component for development. But it's only a mean. We need growth in order to redraw the social face of our nations to distribute better the benefits of economic growth. No, not by giving fish away, but as I said, to provide them the right to learn how to fish. This morning, he came out a pronouncement out of uh, the, Amer the Summit of the Americans from Panama. And 25 was former presidents took a strong position on the issue of Venezuela, talking about giving fish away instead of giving them the right to learn how to fish. The region only will accomplish this enormous opportunity of being the promising continent of the world if we have the courage to meet these challenges. 
diversified economy, investing in the minds of our people, beginning with the poorest of the poorest, the need to be proud of our roots, the need to build strong democratic institutions where the rule of law prevails, the need to be free My friends, I'm standing in front of you this afternoon at this prestigious university because I am free to choose where I go and I'm free to say my word thanks to education. You are only free you only enjoy the democracy that delivers if you have the opportunity to choose. And I chose to come to this prestigious center, to this university. I choose to go around the world. I choose to stand in a position that I believe. the right for inclusion of indigenous people. I can say that loud. I can say it to my president, to the former president, to the king of Spain. When I was elected president, the king of Spain invited us, Ilian and I, to a small room in the royal palace. And he said, Mr. President, the Queen and I have been crossing our fingers for you to be elected president of Peru. Paradox. I said, Your Majesty, you are very kind. But I want to I want you to know it has taken me 500 years to become a president in Latin America and Peru. Because those who can destroy the culture that they found, they were looking just for gold, silver. The conquer cannot kill the soul of the native people. Don't draw any implications, and if you wish, you could, about this country. The need for social inclusion beginning with the poorest of the poor. The need not to be ashamed about your language, the way you dress, the way you look. The region has the opportunity to be the promising continent in the next 35 years if we also are able to recapture the 24 million human couple, men and women who have a bachelor degree, a master degree, a PhD, who are outside Latin America in a diaspora in the world. If we have a state policy to attract that human capital, we can make it. And that's worth more that the gold mines and the Numo and the Peruvian companies can have as a profit. We can make a long way. My friends, identity, the issues that you have touched 
And this seminar has impressed me enormously. We need to make decisions today thinking in the year 2050 when the world will be 9 billion people and will be a great demand for clean water, for food, and for a world that is livable. I want to kill poverty and I want to reduce dramatically inequality. The reason why I say this is because in this morning I uh, met Professor Barry Hughes at the Pardee Center for International Future. So you have a, a data bank with the numbers and that's why I decided not to do the PowerPoint that I originally planned to in a senator to hear. The numbers are there. We need to interpret, interpret the well. Income per capita, or GDP per capita tells you very little. It doesn't tell you anything about the distribution. What it does is takes the total of production of the economy and divide it by the number of people. That presupposes that all the people are the same. But in the rural areas, people don't even earn $1.25 or $2 that makes the, the, the line for poverty. The drama of poverty is not having access to clean water. Just as much as my family did not have. You know, let me make a confession. I suffer for early man, from early malnutrition, so I am short, I'm ugly, but my father, that's what I makes the statistical error. My father decided to migrate from the mountain to the coast, to a seaport in the north of Lima when I was five years old. So the necessity made us to eat fish and fish products, sea products like crazy, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that made me recuperate something on my mind. But that, that's part of the, the statistical error. Part of the statistical error is having met in my shanty town two, two peace corps volunteers who were searching for a place where to live. And we'd, we didn't have a place to give them because we were living 21 people in one house. I persuaded my mother to give them a little space because it was 1963 and Peace Corps requires for the community development work to live in the shanty town where they're supposed to help. And those two Peace Corps volunteers played an incredible role in shaping the, the path of my life. That's part of the, the statistical error. And the world of probabilities, there is all, always a space for an error margin. I'm part of that error margin. But the world does not depend, should not rest only in a, someone who is a result of a statistical error. Men and women have the right to demand health care, clean water, quality of education. Demand strong democratic institutions with justice is made equally for all, not only for those who have money or have influence. The averages hide much more than they reveal. And that's why I think that the challenge of replacing destructive industry in a minimum long term 
is by building minds in the in the, in the minds of our people. Welcome the investment because we need the money to invest in education. 1975, I went to China for the first time. Invited by the Science Academy. After two weeks, 1975, mind you. And I left China with the conclusion that in China, poverty was equally distributed. But that's not the name of the game. We need to build a strong middle class with less inequality in the world, including in the United States, which, by the way, in the last 20 years has increased inequality. Yes, the continent has been growing, and I'm very encouraged by it. But we haven't met the expectations of the other sides of the equation. We haven't yet regrow the social phase of our nations. Latin America is not a homogeneous continent. It's a lot of differences. But on the average, we have the same challenges, the same opportunities. We can do it. I know that you have created a, a new center on Latin American studies. <coughs> I'm hopeful that the United States will be, will have the wisdom to take a look at to the South and perhaps have economic complementarities, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, and sit at the table as equals to confront equal challenges such as narco-trafficking organized crime. And if we do that, I'm glad that we have the Summit of the Americas today. It's concluding in Panama right now, where President Obama met for the first time with Raul Castro. And the issue of Venezuela was raised up. I'm hopeful that as a hemisphere, including Canada, we can do it better by sharing our strength and our weakness. I want to end up by saying this is an enormous privilege. I had, I was lucky to go to great schools, USF, Stanford, Harvard, France, Tokyo, but my best PhD that I got was the partner of my life, Eliane Carp. She has accompanied me, coming from that dramatically different worlds, Russian, Polish, French, Israel, with an Indian shoe shining boy. What the hell do they have in common? You know what? Education has leveled our differences. So I'm free today to say what I believe and what I wrote in this book that I know is provocative and it's going to create a lot of noise. I'm doing a road show. Tomorrow we'll go to Stanford or Berkeley, USF, Washington, D.C., Inter-American Dialogue, the Brooklyn Institute, the World Bank, New York, Council of Americans of the United Nations. From the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for inviting me. For inviting my wife and I. To speak my voice because I'm free. And I can say it. You will see in the media what I believe because I have a choice.
and I have a choice because I have an alternative. I can go to the place I want, say what I believe, we might disagree, and that's good. And I'm not ashamed about my roots to the contrary. I'm very proud of where I come from. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. President. So I would take President uh, Toledo's uh, word as gospel. Uh, he expects and would be very disappointed if you didn't ask uh, real questions, tough questions, uh, uh, am I correct? Absolutely. Yeah, good. I just wanted to double check on that. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, if if you think it's controversial, so much the better. So I will leave you with this wonderful audience. Start right here. Is that right? You have to bear with me because I had to write it down. So hopefully it's a good one. Um, speak up. Yeah. Given the state of indigenous rights in Peru, primarily those of the Andean highlands in relation to water rights, diminishing access to glacially fed fresh water due to climate change, and increasing industrial water appropriation in the form of mineral exploitation that often results in ecosystem contamination, my question is, in the absence of increased environmental protection and uh, the recent increase in socio-environmental conflict in Peru, um, do you see that, uh, Peru to be at risk of more widespread conflict over water in the future? Thank you. Let me answer your questions because it's, and take the next one. The region, not only Peru, is living a, an incredible paradox. We no longer have a military coup. Democracy has expanded. However, there are some outliers, countries in the region. Consequently, the last 15 years, the continent has been growing at a much faster rate than Europe and the United States and India. We have shown that we have learned our lesson and put in our house in order in economic terms. However, that economic growth is taking place together with an increase in social discontent. The social discontent arises from an unequal distribution of the benefits of economic growth and by t being aware that some structured industries are appropriating the lands that belongs to them, contaminate their water, and they don't benefit, they don't benefit from their own natural resources. So the dilemma is, here you have economic growth, but also an increase in social discontent. Complicated by the fact that we have a very fragile democratic institutions. This is a dilemma, a real one. It's not a theoretical one. Before I took a plane to come over here, I received the prime minister at my house, and we, said, we came out with some question. What do we do? Economic growth, it's indispensable. Therefore, Legal stability to attract capital investment, it's very much needed. But economic growth, it's a mean and not an end. I disagree with the economists who think that if you grow by the trickle down effect, the society will be equalized. No, you need to deliver, deliver social policies, environmental policies, small state, strong policies,
that protects the environment, the clean water, and includes the indigenous people to be part of the benefits of the economic growth. I told the Prime Minister and the President, in my foundation we have 23 former presidents and we have asserted this. We have written a social agenda for Latin America. Secretary General of the United Nations asked me to do the social agenda for Africa. It really would be dispersing ourselves. We need to, we have so much in our plates in Latin America and in Peru. But this, that's my belief. And it is not incongruent with having extractive industry because we need income to invest in the minds of our people, to invest in the other minds. We need to attract capital investment. I don't know anything more coward in the world than a dollar, uh, European Union currency, a Chinese currency, or Brazilian currency. They will go out there where there is social, political, economic, and legal stability. Clear rules of the game. We need to resolve the dilemma by distributing better the benefits of our economic growth. But we cannot truncate growth because ultimately we will fall into the irresponsibility of being a populist authoritarian regimes such as the case of Venezuela. Another question. President, this, this follows actually from the last uh, question. Um, and congratulations on your excellent book, which I greatly enjoyed. As you said in your talk, though, reaching the kind of shared society you described is going to take time, maybe 35 years. Yet in uh, a place like Cajamarca in, in Peru, uh, you know, in a place where people are victims of unequal economic development, uh, and uh, political uh, trajectory that in the last number of years has moved away, I think, from something that would be supportive of the shared society. So how, what, how specifically would you suggest that the government work to get support from people who are already poor and suffering to move to a society that's going to take uh, 35 years to reach uh, even though it, it does promise more prosperity for the current generation's grandchildren. I know I did not get into the policy of recommendation, but if you are reading the book, you will, have, you will find a chapter that says, to the vein. One of the difficulties that the continent has is the state capacity to deliver what the person of the World Bank calls, calls the science of delivery. We don't have this, the needed stock of human capital to deliver results for the regional and province and district governments. Cajamarca is a state, a rich one, and minerals. Yes, it's the second poorest state in the nation. Now, when I take a look at all the countries in the region, the same pattern with a different level takes place. Maybe people are impatient. It is 500 years. How much longer can we wait? Of course, this dilemma of economic growth with social discontent will discourage people, and maybe they don't have the patience. That is why I don't find 
any incompatibility between stimulating investment even in the social and the structural industry, but not only dependent on the exporting of raw material. We need to be more in control and less vulnerable of our economy by diversifying into agro-industry, science and technology, innovation, healthcare, education, ecotourism, we can generate incomes. As I said, it's not incompatible because we need the, the money to invest in the minds of our people. Yes, I agree with you. There are some politicians who take advantage of the poverty of the people who surround the communities where the mines are. I know, I know in Colorado you have there is a company over here, Newmont, who has an investments in Peru. Welcome to Peru. But you can be sure that while I'm still alive, I will go around the world demand that welcome of that investment, but you need to comply with the social environmental responsibility and make a participant of the benefits of the natural resources to the local community, to the indigenous people, whose land belongs also to them, and they need to be also beneficiaries of the economic growth. It would be a mistake. What I think you you question implies certain knowledge of what is happening in politics. There are some groups who are deliberately obstructing investment in the extractive industries. It's a mistake. In the short and medium term, we need them. But that doesn't preclude our rights to demand to comply with the, with the social and environmental responsibility. And if you don't do it, it's a weak government. Because if you have a weak government, if you don't share the benefits of that, you will nourish the social discontent, which will in turn will create a vicious circle of stopping your investment. There are some companies, Las Bambas, Tia Maria, Narequipa. Stop. It's a mistake. We need it in the short term. Let me present it to you, give me your question. That there are countries in the world, and the empirical evidence that is strong, that they have absolutely no natural resources. I lived in Japan for two years and was a professor at Waseda University. And in Japan, after the Second World War, as you well know better than I do, once the war was ended with a bomb, General McCarthy went to Japan with instructions from the President of the United States and told the Japanese, you are not allowed to invest more than 2% of our GDP in defense. They made him a great favor. They invested in nutrition, healthcare, and they produced, this is the, Japan now is the third economy in the world. Second example, South Korea was a cheap labor for Japanese. When you used to buy Panasonic, Sony, or Canon, and the back said, made in Korea. In 1960, the South Korean government made a decision to send the young kids abroad to study with a contract. That after they finish, they stay two more years and then return. Today, South Korea is uh, 
industrialized technology country. Third, Europe does not have any natural resources. Unfortunately, it's dependent from gas from Russia. And Russia is not very kosher. Putin, uh, I, I know him for five years. He's not the most charming guy that I know in my life. <laughs> Israel, a tiny country, no water, just tiny bit of from Jordan. No natural resources whatsoever. Unfortunately, they just found some gas. But what they did is they were forced to invest in human capital. Of course, Israel is an exception in the sense that a charge on the factors took place that helped them, such as the fall of or the former Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall, and so the Jews who were in Russia, who were medical doctors, engineers, uh, a rich human capital, were recaptured into Israel. And today, Israel has an strong economy, high technology, despite the politicians. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the lady first. a few times about the importance of uh, teaching people to fish uh, uh, instead of just giving the fish. You also mentioned about capital investments and economic growth. And since I was born in Peru, and I also uh, witnessed that incredible transformation in Peru, my question is, what would you say to the ones who believe that distribution of wealth uh, instead of promoting for the private sector and uh, is having a central, central planning economy or the ideas of socialism as a way to improve the economy is the way to go. Thank you so much. I insist. People, no matter where are they born? What is their gender? How tall you are? Demand the right to learn how to fish. I come from extreme poverty and I consider it an insult to the poor to give the fish away. That's too easy if you have oil or minerals. So I agree with that. And I insist on that and I stay strong. Capital investment? Yes, no. It is not in incongruent, as I said, the need to attract capital investment because we need economic growth. We cannot have economic growth without capital investment. And we cannot attract capital investment without social political, economic, and legal stability. But once you grow, you have the enormous responsibility to distribute the benefits of economic growth more equally, beginning with the poorest of the poor. Empirical evidence shows, I'm not a medical doctor, that intellectual capacity of an individual is determined in the first year of the life. And it begins when the mother is pregnant. If you have a child with early malnutrition until five years old, after five years old, then you begin in a competition in the world in a disadvantage. You can invest all the money you want in education, but they will perform very poorly. That is the importance of the interrelationship between killing 
early malnutrition, providing health care and educational quality, science and technology, innovation, diversification and the production of the economy are important decisions that we need to make. That doesn't mean that we should tell the miners or the oil exporters not to come. Just establish the rules of the game. <clears throat> Just as much as the state has the responsibility to respect legal stability, they have the responsibility to comply with the social and environmental responsibility. We need to establish the rules of the game clearly, looking at with ambition to the medium and long term. I know that's not very profitable for politicians because they want to make a decision as a, as a function of the next election. I'm no longer working on that. I'm stubborn. I went through a difficult moment. Let me confess to you that I, by being where I am and coming from, I come from the dictator regime made my life very miserable. They control everything, the press. So my popularity dropped to 8% at a given point. 8% popularity. So some people in the, in the Congress want to vacate me. And I was stubborn, excuse me, persistent and trying to manage the economy in order to have something to distribute. Because the ultimate end was to distribute. So we recreated a healthcare for the poor, free. Last week I discovered that this program has benefited 15.15 million Peruvians. That's half of the population of the country. And my popularity dropped 8%. When I left the country, when I left the government, I left the growing at 7.5%, 68% popularity. So you need to, uh, to plant in order to harvest and to stick to what you believe. If you are the captain of a ship in a very turbulent sea, and if you don't know what you want to go, the people that are surrounding you will not know what you want. And at the end, you will run out of gas or petroleum, and you will fail. I'm sure I could have done better. I'm sure I made a mistake. But if you don't want to make a mistake, don't get out of your bed. One thing I have learned from this country is that in order to make an omelet, you have to break an egg. I have another version that I will not say public. <laughs> another question. He says we have time for one last question and then we'll have good food that should not go to waste and time for book signing. Yes. So one more question, Mr. President. Mr. President, Milo Blanco uh, from Peru and Antash, like yourself. Antashino, like yourself. <laughs> My question is, we've seen investment coming into the country like Peru and throughout Latin America, yet I feel like we've missed opportunity to start killing poverty as we have expressed yourself. And in large part, I feel like it's been through corruption at state level and local government levels. In your opinion, how should we address corruption in, our, in Latin America as a whole? And do you think it's a byproduct of the lack of education that's produced in our country? There are some politicians who do not like to have an educated population. Because if they were well educated, they would never in their life vote for them. 
yes, corruption is a crew issue that is related with our weak democratic institutions, the judicial system, lack of control, lack of capacity to deliver. So let me finish by providing one uh, policy recommendation that is in the book on the chapter to the vein. What we have decided to we explored it at Stanford. We're going to take two districts. A district that received the greatest amount of money out of the canon and royalties from raw material. San Marcos, you are from Ancash? Yeah, I've been there. San Marcos, 350 million a year. The mayor builds a, a municipal palace with polarized glasses and a Bullfighter Plaza, enormously. No portable water, no sanitation, no education. A lot of corruption. Cusco, Quillabamba, where the, the gas of Camisea began. It receives 850 million soles a year. The mayor built a huge palace, municipal palace, polarized, and an Olympic swimming pool. No portable water, no sanitation, no education. Something is happening. When I decided to share the power with the states and with the province by doing the state reform of decentralization. I'm responsible for that, for the good or for bad. And by the way, the good things for my government is due to my collaborators. The mistakes are mine. And the decentralization, there were some mistakes. We did not have enough controls, and we didn't have the needed human capital to implement the projects and deliver concrete results. Consequently, the recommendation is to ask the community in San Marcos, Echarate is in Cusco where Camisea comes, to ask them to prioritize one or two major projects that the community needs. campesinos, the indigenous people. They determine the priority. And we, we need to hire six or seven technocrats, well paid. A manager, an accountant, an anthropologist, a communicator, well paid. And ask the mine owner or the petroleum owner of the halls to give to the community $200 million directly to the community without going to the central government. And every three months, you check about how much progress are they making, these technocrats that comes from outside the community. You have to make sure that the company doesn't buy the leader of the community. Have to be careful. So a company will say, listen, come on, why should I give you $200 million? That's not my responsibility. That's the government's responsibility. Well, I'll tell you what, deduct from what you have to pay to the central government in terms of royalty and canon, deduct it from there and you give it directly to the community. But you have to deliver concrete and measurable results to the vein. We will do a two pilot projects in Peru because I don't want to do it in all the countries which will be getting into problems and we'll see what the results are. Really. Listen, once again, from the bottom of our hearts, Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come to this university.
that I discover its prestige and the subject matters in which you are concerned. It touches very much my own concern, my mind and my heart. God bless you. Thank you very much. Again, as we hit the sun, uh, oh, thank you all very much for coming this evening. We have uh, very good food, not normal graduate grub fare. Uh, as I said today at noon, it's not pizza, it's really real food, right? Uh, so please help yourselves. Books, uh, President Toledo's book are available in the corner. We're going to move one of the tables up here during the reception time so that you can have your book signed by President Toledo. Uh, and uh, and so enjoy each other's company and we'll be here for a little while. I'll be very disappointed if there is any food that we have to give back to Sodexo. So please help yourself. Thank you again very much.